I like to keep things secure. Um, I'm involved with hardware, software, conferences, so I help some other things. Uh, my blog, social. So, as a Linux, first a quick introduction, um, then um, exactly what it is, and then how to use it. Um, this isn't a real policy defining session um, or workshop uh, or how to deploy that to 5,000 machines. Um, it's mainly to get you started if you are not already using as a Linux or if you have for some um, strange red reason stopped using it. Uh, and I'm referring to the company run by a Larry person. He likes to say in his book, disable as a Linux. Uh, I don't like that. So, first, misconceptions. Yeah, so you saw in the introduction I had, life is too short uh, to live insecurely. So, Theodore Tzu had actually said life is too short to understand as a Linux. Um, that was, of course, in um, the very early stages. Um, so, uh, that was when CentOS 4 was around. Um, at that point, it was really a difficult thing. Not everybody could run it. Not everybody um, was able to understand the full complexity. Um, many of the policies that today exist were not there, so you had to write everything manually. Um, again, this has improved over time. CentOS 6 is more or less production ready, and CentOS 7 will have a full as a Linux stack in there, on the complete level. Um, for those which are on KitKat, your phones have now as a Linux in there also. Yeah, Android 4.4, I think it is. Mm -hmm. The nickname is KitKat, so. Yeah, this is what I get to hear a lot. Um, while I don't disagree with it 100%, if you're running CentOS 4 and for some strange reason you're still running it, yes, as a Linux may be a pain in the ass. But then I think you have other pains in the asses that you need to address first. Um, CentOS 5 was a big improvement, especially if you look like at 5.7, 5.8, it was more or less workable. Um, 6.1 and 6.2 became workable um, out of the box. Um, so now this isn't valid anymore. Then yes, the famous upstream vendor tells you to disable it in their user manual. Um, uh, you can shoot the user manual, you can shoot the vendor, uh, you can shoot a lot of stuff, but we have to live with that. Then, the famous quote, use as a Linux or app armor. So, as a Linux was defined from an um, enterprise point of view. It's designed by the NSA. We know that they, they love privacy, they love uh, <laughs> security. So, they had all of this in mind. App Armor was made from a desktop environment upward. Um, you don't necessarily, oh, I don't secure my desktop as much as I would secure my server. So I think that using desktop security on servers is a little bit wrong. It should most probably be using server security on the desktop. And we see that in the hardware also. Um, mainframes have been around much longer, have been doing virtualization. We now have that on our phones even. So it has gone from bigger systems to smaller ones. So that's why I think here the same thing. You have to start from a big thing and go to the smaller ones. Then of course the good. So um, a security author and a guru gave this quote about how the NSA of course can only deliver security and privacy. This quote was of course pre uh, Big Brother watching you, so. But it basically means that if they can trust this software to not have people spy on them while they spy on other people, then we would be able to presume that they couldn't spy on us. Again, this code is open source. If you don't trust it, you can read everything. Um, I suggest you take a few months holiday to do that, but it is possible. So. I presume everybody knows Linux. Linux has a very simple security method. Uh, I call it the 3x3 three three matrix. It's basically just binary form um, and then represent it, represented it with these numbers. So when you do chmod, 
you give like uh, 755 um, and those are presented in read, write for the user, the group or the others. That's quite simple. Now that means that you have uh, a singular uh, base system. A file can only belong to a particular user or to a particular group, which means that if you need to access that by multiple um, entities, then you need to give it different types of uh, rights, which might not be exactly what you need. Um, also, these rights, anybody with root access can change them. You don't necessarily want people with root access doing that. Um, and for some of the software to execute, like firmware updates on your hardware, you need to give people root access. So it's not an option to disable the root access completely. So what says a Linux? It's a mandatory access control. Um, it does that in different styles. It has what it calls type enforcement, role-based enforcement, and multi-level enforcement. So again, for people using CentOS 4, the type base were quite well defined. CentOS 5 added role-based. Um, CentOS 6 now has MLS. So for those people running uh, um, KVM with SFIRT in there, you're running automatically MLS in there. The MLS basically is that you um, generate uh, a three-dimensional matrix for uh, security. Uh, sometimes even four-dimensional matrices, depending on how you set up your machine, um, which makes it sometimes a little bit difficult to understand in the beginning. <coughs> so yeah, type-based um, are mainly defined in policies, um, and in the older versions you had something called the target policy, a targeted <coughs> policy, which meant that only particular demons were targeted. Um, in the role-based, you're looking at the user level. So you're telling that, for instance, um, the Apache, uh, as a Linux user, can only read particular uh, folders or can only access particular uh, ports. Uh, so you even limit the ports in there. And with multi-level, what you're doing there is telling that a particular category can be used by multiple people. So you create a specific category that then can be used by multiple roles or types in there. So how does it visually look? Uh, in the older versions, you could get to the kernel. So once you had root access, you could basically do anything uh, on your machine. Um, in the current version, um, so in a default setup, once you log in as root, you will still get 99% uh, of the access to the kernel. So only if you separate that based on your roles, you can then say that if root logs in with um, the user Toshan, then he can only get at Apache and MySQL, while if uh, root logs in from a different user that he uh, gets a different role um, based on, for instance, only being able to get access to MySQL because he's a DBA. So that, that means that at that point you can do your chmod commands um, only on those things that are labeled for MySQL or for whatever your role is applicable for. Um, in this, there is also a role called unconfined, which means that that user basically can do anything on the machine. Well, I mean, if, if, uh, if the process when, uh, runs unconfined as the unconfined users, it means that SNLX is not verifying what the user is doing, but you still have the standard file system protection preventing a user from getting access to a file he's not supposed to. So it's, yeah, it's another layer. It's another layer. So. But it's the unconfined for as a Linux means that it, it won't it's check washed. anything, yeah. it won't do anything. Uh, you can execute as a user all commands, as a daemon, you can do whatever you want. Yes. Um, so for those people who use Skype, for instance, for some odd reason, Skype under Linux wants to read Holy or etc. Um, I don't know why it needs to do that. So, for instance, on my laptop when I tried to install Skype to talk to a family of mine abroad, I was like, this doesn't run. And then you start debugging it and you see that it tries to read all of etc. The only way was to put it in unconfined and run it then. Or to create a VM now uh, and run from the VM your uh, specific needs. So the features there, there's a full list. The main, most important is you have policy enforcement rules. Um, which we will see later how you can define those. 
you have a lot, if not 90% of all open source software predefined in policies today. Um, even some of the closed source software has policies available. So if you're, let's say, like installing an RPM from um, uh, IBM Tivoli Storage Manager, it comes with an SA Linux policy now. Of course, that's not for all of the products in closed source. Huh? But I know a few of them where the, the vendors have taken the effort to go that uh, distance and create those policies. Again, this might not be for your use case, but there is something at least there to start from. Um, yeah, you can do independent labeling. Uh, so chcom is the command. We'll see that later. You can control the file systems. You can, let's say, if you are an, uh, a hoster, and in place of uh, using the standard uh, var www for your uh, web environment, you use home. You can or set a boolean, or if it is, let's say, located on an NFS, in a custom uh, mount, then you can add that particular mount point or mount location to the um, labeling of uh, Apache. And yeah, it controls processes and the pods, so also your network stack. So let's say you want to run uh, Apache on port um, 888, and you do that in the configuration, you do that nicely, you restart Apache, you will nicely get failed, that's all. It will not tell you why it failed. You can go to the log and you will see that Apache failed to start because it couldn't get the port. So your first reaction might be there's something else running on port 888. You do a net stat, nothing. Um, if you install the machine with the official um, kickstart from Red Hat, you would have the audit log in there. And in audit log it will give you uh, a semi-cryptic message which can be read in by SA um, search. SH. Uh, SH. Uh, search or SE alone? Yeah, both, both can do it. Um, if, if you're more familiar with it, you will just see like HTTP and then you will realize, oh, the port couldn't be accessed, denied. Oh, yes, I forgot to add the port to the uh, manage list. Um, so it basically controls all aspects of the operating system. Some features that are uh, a little bit more awkward is that um, for people who run Gen2, um, what you need to do is emerge your system then emerge as a Linux, and then change to the root. But if you forgot to give a root, the root privileges are unconfined, then you can log into root, but you can't do anything anymore. So you've rigged all your system. Of course, in pre-compiled distributions, that does not happen. Uh, but there are still some other sticky points, like when you're installing Oracle DB, um, you have the Oracle DB user, um, which is defined. It by default will not get the, the correct um, user enforcement there. So you need to add that manually. Um, and yeah, you can restrict root user. If you do that, please understand what you're doing or see that you have a serial console or run level one enabled so that you can unbrick your system. Um, so, again, from a history point of view, as the Linux and the kernel, we are there already a long time. Um, so that's what CentOS 4 was about, mainly in the kernel. The things on top of it were implemented by custom features, basically. CentOS 5, we had the kernel. You had Postgres with the SA Linux extension. Um, you had Apache with Mod SA Linux, um, which today is still an extension, I think. Um, you have, for instance, Nginx, which is also becoming very popular. Um, you can basically compile it with as a Linux in there and it comes then standard out of the box. So we see that we're coming to this situation where um, your whole or your complete system will be manageable with as a Linux and you will be able to secure and compartmentalize each of these subsections individually and say that okay I want to give um, compartment number one to a particular customer, compartment number two to a different customer and have isolation between the compartments. So even on the process level, we will be able to do that uh, in CentOS 7 normally. In this picture, we're assuming that the Apache server runs with as a Linux, but you have a multi-tenant environment, and we too have PHP scripts 
that run as a, as Apache. If I create a script that reads your directory and Apache can read, no. That, that so, to, uh, but what you have to do then is you have to um, define forking processes and categorize particular forking processes to particular um, categorizations. So that means that Apache as a daemon can see everything, but a fork from um, your particular execution can only see your uh, subdirectory in there. Okay. So it's uh, binding together mod SC Linux and mod user SC no, as a, it, no, it's as a Linux but on the MLS level. So okay. not on the simple level. On the simple level you're just telling to Apache to do there you're telling Apache that, okay, I'm giving you these categories, mm -hmm. and every time you spawn or you fork from a particular process, that category can only read further from that category. So you will have to define the categorization on uh, Apache level. There's a specific version of Apache that can do that. The standard one doesn't do that out of the box. Okay. Um, excuse me. Yeah. So Apache has a config. Why is it in this? Yes. Okay. Well, uh, in fact, that's not that's, that's the, that's the reverse way. In fact, all binaries that you can find in Red Hat Enterprise Linux or CentOS are the default one. Yeah. But there is a special package that co that's called SLinux Linux Policy Target that knows everything about all the demons running on a machine. So that package is... Um, yeah, but for most level, level, that doesn't... No, not for other but for standard yeah. way... For standard, that's the rule. So Apache is defined in your SLinux Linux Policy, the RPM package, yeah. and that is what you get. But if you want to do this fine grade, then you need to define them in config files yourself. But MLS is, is, is just an example I give, um, because I get the question a lot from, um, uh, what are they called, uh, web posters. Um, and they ask, how can we use it? Yes, you can use it even today, but these are custom things. These are not out of the box. Out of the box, Apache is in your SA Linux uh, policy uh, RPM package. So one of the, the examples I was telling you, somebody else is um, I implement Zarafa, which is a collaboration system, and I wrote my own policy. I pushed it to Zarafa. They were too lazy to push it. Uh, so Red Hat took the responsibility of, of doing that. Of course, when I created my policy, I called it Zarafa. So when I did Hume update and as a Linux policy got updated, all my policy got overwritten with the default. So that's why you have to be careful about these type of things. Um, in this example, what I should have done is called it Zarafa and some odd name or number so that if it gets overwritten by the default, because Red Hat, Suze, all these companies are busy making all these policies and updating them, that they don't override your own policy at that point. So yeah, where is SA Linux? Um, it was added in 2002 about, um, with a 2.6.0 kernel. Um, main availability and distribution was uh, Red Hat 4, so CentOS 4, uh, Fedora Core 2. Um, if you ever used it on Fedora Core 2, um, you were a genius, I think, uh, because the very first implementations were very tricky. Um, yeah, in the meanwhile, uh, SLES, OpenSUSE, Gen 2, Debian even has a, a, a special um, uh, installation for it. Ubuntu, even though it's not mentioned on their uh, default website, has it. Um, Android has embraced it. Um, yeah, so Android SE is a special version. So before it was called Android SE. Um, as I said from uh, 4.4, it's integrated in your standard uh, system. And most probably you'll find it in other distributions I don't even know about. Why do you want to use it? Because it confines processes, users, and um, services. Um, it allows you to run um, virtual machines in a segregated way. So um, HP, Red Hat um, actually <coughs> went through the, the exercise. So for those people who were at the IBM sessions, you see them um, talking about EAL4 and EAL5. Um, so the if you run SFIRT with the correct configuration, of course, um, you can get EAL4. It's still lower than what the power has. The power has EAL4+, plus. Uh, Z has EAL5+, plus. Um, but for a small x86 machine, it's still quite high. 
Um, then if you're running kiosk-based systems, you can use something called XGuest, um, which allows you to have a confined user um, running as a guest user, and you can basically try to do anything with the machine, you can't break it. Um, I have it running with a few customers of mine, and I really have people trying to break the machine. The only time they broke the machine was when they physically threw the machine out of the window, which I don't count as a failure on the SSN inspired. Uh, yeah, for hardware, um, so USB redirect for those that use Spice has this uh, feature built in. Um, if you're driving uh, a German car, the chances are very high that you have a Linux in your car. Um, and your yeah, smartphones are already mentioned. And the main point, it isn't that difficult. So this is most of the theory that you need to know uh, to understand the non-MLS section of Azure Linux. <coughs> and I've actually gone over some of the MLS parts, so, and I don't think that's much more difficult. It only becomes difficult when you need to design that for, let's say, 20 layers. So, what are the, the states you can be in? Enforcing means that it's on the machine, policies have been loaded, and they will be enforced. They will uh, not allow rogue uh, things to happen. <coughs> Permissive um, will allow the normal usage but will log everything to the audit log. At that point this is very good if you're creating policies. So you put it in permissive, you let your users run there for two weeks, you take the machine, you take your logs, you generate your policy from there. Obviously you need to use some common sense and see uh, that the policy generated is not uh, doing things that you don't want it to do, but it gives you a good idea. And then the, the obvious one you don't want to have is disabled. So how, if, if let's say tomorrow somebody comes with a system and they need to see what happens. So you do as a status and it will tell you in which state it is. Normally it will tell you enforcing and then it will tell you also what the base policy that was loaded. So a version number, then with your upstream vendor you can see um, what that version number actually means, which policies are in there. Uh, permissive, um, and then you have the, the capital Z. So all the commands we know, if you add the capital Z, then you will get the SA Linux um, extension, basically. So it will give you an output of how that looks. So, as you see here, as a status, you see the policy version, you see what where the um, config file is and what it is um, set at. And then if you do, you get here for instance, yeah, unconfined because this is my home directory. But you see here that this is the file type um, user underscore home underscore t. Um, the u is for the user type and the r is for the uh, role type. So you have user, role, um, and file type. And this S0 is actually the um, MLS categorization. So you have here S0 mostly, and then you will have sometimes an, a comma, and then a C, and then a category behind it. That can be one category, that can be multiple categories behind it. Um, uh, I mean, it has, the files are, files have uh, unconfined. My files in my home directory are unconfined. Yes. So I can do in my home directory whatever I want. I, because I, for instance, need Python 27, yes. so I need to run that, but, um, well, initially I used to run that from my home directory, and meanwhile I have RPM packages for that. Um, but for that reason, you can give your home, uh, your own user unconfined so that you can write anything within your directory. So, uh, you mean so un an unprivileged user? Yeah, un 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 uh, unconfined yeah. Di home directory. No, that's, no, that's the default. I mean, something you have to just understand with SLN is the fact that, oh, sorry if I do some hijacking with no, the no, no, no. Um, by default, you know, SLN was just started what it knows about. So, Basically, it has targeted policy for HTTPD, so for which user? Apache, for example. Because uh, people writing policies know that uh, HTTP is supposed to run with the Apache user. So Apache is a, a, is a system well, it's a system user, so it's confined. 
But the first users create manual machine, of course, by default inherits the unconfined because you know, the, the guy writing the SNMX policy doesn't know about your specific user if you are creating the machine, right? It is unconfined in the fact that everything that you want to run yourself is not known about SLMX. But it doesn't mean that you can run anything on your machine. Then you, then you fall back to the standard uh, Linux permission, right? <laughs> so don't, don't forget that SLMX is just an extra layer of security. So it has to go through all the mechanisms. So even if SLMX lets you do something, of course, you will, and you are not um, authorized to do something on the system, you will be uh, stopped by the system itself, right? So yeah, I, I can do that for PS. Uh, I can do that for Netstat. Yeah, that will be slow here. So you see there also, you see here for instance these categorizations coming up. Um, that's because you have uh, other things. I have Pigeon running there, which has multiple uh, Categorizations there. So basically, adding the capital Z gives you the explanation of what the SA Linux contexts are there. So, the most important or the most commonly um, changeable one is file um, context. That means that, like, if you see here, For the Apache, you have httpd underscore sys underscore content underscore t. So that means that if this label is not applied on the file system, that means you won't be able to see uh, mrtg here. The, the way that works is an, an object asks a particular permission for a subject. So you see here. Um, <coughs> So Apache, oh yeah, I'm not, I don't have access to that. Um, so Apache will normally run as httpd uh, underscore t. That is the um, role type that Apache gets as a daemon. And that um, particular one can access httpd underscore sys underscore content underscore t, but also http underscore uh, config underscore um, something else. I don't know all of them by heart, but so it can read its config files, it can read its content, it can read only those particular labels. That's why if you don't label it correctly, it will not get access and you will get their uh, forbidden page uh, once you start it up. So there are multiple ways of doing that. Um, you can use chcom, so changing the context. Um, the minus T specifies that you only are changing the type. Uh, the minus capital R is recursive um, and then you could do that on this particular directory. Now that means that at that point you're going to start the relabeling. Let's say this is a f this had maybe two files, it will take a second and it will be done. Uh, let's talk, say you're talking about 20 gig, it will take a little bit of time. Um, but if you have restore con daemon running or you reboot your machine, what it will do is it will look in the default policies and it will see that user srvww is unknown to me so I relabel it to whatever is the default unknown, the unconfined state. And at that point Apache will not be able to read this anymore again. To change it permanently you need to use as a manage then uh, fcontext means the file context you want to add a particular type um, and then you need to give the regular expression there. So you need to have some puzzling abilities in this. Um, <coughs> it's quite easy to do this. If you don't know how to puzzle, don't worry. You run as a manage f context minus l and grip on something and it will show you what it is and you can copy paste from there. Um, again, it's not that difficult. Now if you've done this, what you can then do is do restore com. So let's say you had an NFS mount for your var www.html and you 
take that uh, NFS mount out and you create the directory manually, you will need to run restore con the first time before it restores all the files that were copied from the NFS. So that's another thing that's a little bit complicated. When you create a file, let's say I create this file in file www.html uh, slash index.html, it will create it with the right label at that time. So it will get HTTP D underscore uh, uh, sys underscore content underscore T. However, if I make it in my home directory and then I move it to the right location, because it was created in my home directory, I will get user underscore home underscore T. So I will need to relabel it at that point. So that's something that people keep keep on forgetting that if you try to do SCP and you SCP first to your home directory and then move it to the right directory, it got created at the point in your home directory and you need to do a relabeling. Or you can run restore con which restores it to whatever the default is of that directory. Then if you for some strange reason uh, started your machine in disabled state and you need to enable it. Uh, you have the, the joyous uh, thing to um, relabel all your file system. Or even worse, you installed, you during the installation you said no to as a Linux, then no file systems, uh, sorry, no contexts were written for file system, for processes or for uh, policies at all. So you need to do complete relabeling. At that point you need to do gen home dircon, which generates uh, a special relabeling for your home directory. Then you need to add this uh, dot auto relabel in your uh, root file system and do a reboot. At that point what happens is the machine reboots, it loads up uh, the kernel in read-only mode and then starts relabeling all your file system. So if you have a few terabytes I would say get multiple coffees and or find something else to do during that point. And in the beginning there were many people who did not understand this. Uh, this takes a very long because it's basically going to each inode and writing those as a Linux extensions in there. So it's, it's disk based. How faster the disks you have, the faster it will go. But it's an IO problem, it's not an as a Linux problem. Well, then if you... Just yeah. in this case, would you suggest if you have an opportunity of installing as a Linux maybe in... I'm missing I'm, No, it's, start over. If you did the install off and you created a new... That might be a possibility in some cases, but imagine you have um, remote access and you don't have IMMs or ELOs or um, AMMs to, or an HMC to control the machine. Mm -hmm. uh, there is no way you can do a remote install without any of these additional features. Uh, Unless you have a pixie or something. No. I mean, well, in that particular case, you can just. That's what we do for CentOS. We just reinstall manually the machine. We just grab the the the, the editor image and the kernel, and we just reinstall from a, a local install machine through VNC. But that's not the case. Of, that's not what we have to, to talk about. It's possible. No, I am. I'm thinking about a vi uh, highly virtualized environment where you have all these thousand VMs, and then you just on the VM level you're talking. Yeah. Well, no, I'm thinking, I'm, I'm thinking on the hypervisor yeah, level. 1000 VMs currently SC Linux disabled and you say, well, everything is on public, thankfully. And you just say, well, we're going to SC Linux now. So it's probably easier for us. Yeah, but for you it might be easier to just use Puppet and redeploy them with SC Linux. Um, it would be quicker, it would be more manageable. The only thing you need to pay attention is your data being uh, saved securely sure. and for that data you will still have to do relabeling so depending on how your environment is you can do the relabeling while the reinstallation is happening so then the relabeling is happening because the data needs to be labeled correctly while the new installations are happening and by the time the new installations finish your relabel should also be finished then you would have no uh, or the least amount of work because you would be able to boot up the machines with the correct labels then Uh, you said earlier if you move files or if you put them in your home directory and then move them somewhere else, you have to relabel them. Is there a way to have a flag with MV to do the relabeling for you while you move it? Because that's yeah. the modus operandi. You copy your file to a system and then you log in as root, move it somewhere else. 
<laughs> yes and no. Uh, Dan Walsh, so one of the main contributors from yeah, Red Hat, well, said main. that it was it was now the default case for uh, the latest version in Rolex. So typically in Fedora 20, what two? Well, 21, well, well, yeah. 21, that would. But uh, actually, no, you have to do it yourself. But no, there would be a flag just to do a CP and. and for for CP, there is a flag. Yeah. But for MV, there is no flag that I know of. Even that, that said, it, well, it started a conversation, conversation a thread on the list about possible things. Yeah. It, it's it it's a big discussion on doing that because, again, if you do that, then every time you move a file, it's basically allowing the file to be accessed by whatever you're moving it to. And that's not always what you want. So there's a big debate. I know older versions couldn't do it at all. Forget it. Newer versions can do it. CP does it if you add a flag. Um, MV doesn't do it as far as I know. And most of the, the, the scripts use MV. Yeah, so you yeah because like, if I, that's where I run into it, I copy a pub key or something, put it in an authorized keys file, and uh, it doesn't work because I have to relabel one. But that, that's a different kind of problem, you know, if you do it manually, but if you, have, if you use a configuration management system, yeah. you know, all the, no. all the decent... Ansible has solved that problem. It mm -hmm. relabels it on the fly to the right one. Yeah. Yes, I know. I had, I, I, I commit a patch to, and you need the Libus Linux Python to do that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. you first need to install that. Papa does that from the beginning, right? Even if you don't specify the SL user and then SL white, he sees that, he knows that, and it, it will do the, that correctly for the authorized key module. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for Ansible, it, it does it for all the files, but yes. if you so do it manually, then. If you use a configuration management, it is, whatever yes. it is, Puppet, Ansible, or Chef, whatever, mm -hmm. they, they, they know how to do that. So, but if you do that manually, that's a problem. That's well, not an issue, you know? Well, then it's your manual obligation to change it. Huh? Yeah, if you want to go the manual way, you have to fix things in your manual way as well. So the last command, fix files, is if you create a policy, then you have a spec file and you can actually um, use fix files to create all the, the, the set of um, uh, permissions for that particular directory that you are creating the files from. Booleans. So like I said, Red Hat and many of the other vendors have um, taken the time to create default policies. <coughs> Um, one very typical example is um, allowing Apache to run from the home directory. Um, allowing uh, libvirt to have NFS access. These are all booleans you can set. Um, so that means that you don't have to write your own policy, you don't have to do anything. So um, you have get as a bool minus a, which gives you the full list of all booleans on your system. Uh, that's why the grab behind it. Um, <laughs> set as a bool which sets the boolean uh, or toggle as a bool which toggles it um, if you use set as a bool um, and you want it to be done permanently minus capital P um, and then for the port so as a manage is basically a more generic uh, Python tool which uh, goes through all of these things so in bit as a manage you can do <coughs> port minus L and it will give you the list of all the ports again there minus A to add minus T the type and then in this type, um, so ports have a particular protocol type, TCP or UDP, so you need to specify that and then the port number. And for files, we already saw how to do that. Um, then, audit to Y um, will give you a human readable explanation. Um, as a troubleshoot, <coughs> will also give you more or less human readable uh, outputs. Um, my preferred way is looking at the audit log, it's the easiest. It will tell you what the subject is, what the object is, why it got denied. Uh, sometimes a little bit cryptic, I agree. Um, if you're used to it, it's not that cryptic. So it depends what flavor you prefer. The tools are all there, available, um, all on the command line and in the GUI. So if you first want to learn on the GUI, the same commands are there on the command line. Well, there is yeah. one, but it's that I know of that's not open source. Really? Yeah, I, the Tivoli Security Manager. Okay. Yeah, uh, I was at a bank, 
and they have the tool implemented and it's doing the auditing on that for as a link specifically. So with Red Hat. Doesn't ship with any, any Not that I know of. No. 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 But you know, if you just combine what we were just saying here with the Bruno spoke about um, centralized logging. Yeah. yeah. You know, if you just pipe everything coming to var log, audit log, if there is a denial of something, you, you will see IDC deny something. Yeah. And then it's structured with the name of the process, mm -hmm. why? So you can just trigger an alert or something like that. Yeah. Well, as a troubleshoot and a tool to forward all the EPCs to the central. Yeah, you can do that. Yeah. Yeah, but then you're running an extra daemon. Let's say if you run, like me, a small VM with 256 megabytes, you don't want as a uh, troubleshoot daemon running there, so you just use your normal syslog uh, solution. And then whatever sys central syslogging tool you use can alert you for that. But normally, var log audit, audit log is the central tool for everything. Even all those other tools are most of the time looking at that. So that's, that's why I mentioned it's better to take a little bit time off and to look at that, understand that, and then you know everything. So what is a policy? A policy uh, is defined for um, access control, uh, labeling, and is then compiled into a binary form which is then um, inserted into a database. The binary form is mainly because of speed. So uh, for those people who started with SA Linux when it was like CentOS 4, your traditional overhead was about 2 to 5%, uh, again, in small cases. Huh? Um, today it is 0 0.00001, so it is negligible uh, overhead. Um, unless you're doing it like real, real time, um, but even in the real time I've seen people use SA Linux and not having uh, issues with it. So unless there are specific uh, cards where you are uh, running instant solutions on, there might be some issues with overhead, but the overhead today is worth uh, nothing. How does it look in a, in a nice graphic? So the subject asks the, as a Linux uh, security server, which is basically a module loaded <coughs> in the kernel, um, um, it asks the database, which is also loaded into the kernel, that uh, do I get permission? If he gets permission, okay, nothing. If he doesn't get permission, you get the AVC denial log in your audit log. Then getting to the as a Linux database, um, the most easiest way is of course taking the source package of as a uh, Linux policy, uh, looking into there, you have the TEs and the FEs and all the, the files that get compiled into PPs. Um, Another way is using get as a bool and as a search. Uh, so um, as a bool will give get as a bool will give you all of them. As a manage bool minus l will give you a list and the possibilities with a short description. So with get as a bool, it just gives you the name of the boolean um, and whether it's on or off. With as a manage, it will give you a short description. With as a search minus b and then the boolean minus capital AC, it will give you a small text about what it is. Um, you can do that on the boolean, on the subject, on the type. Um, and then again with uh, set as a rule, you can set them here. Yeah. So let's say you have um, uh, to generate a specific policy, then uh, you can actually look at var log audit log, um, you can grab that into audit to allow, which is a tool which will generate a policy for you. Um, and you see here the, the M for the module name that will be added. So you're not extending on the base, you're creating a separate module. Um, and it gets uh, written to a TE file. Then you check the module um, here, the Minus capital M means that you're going to create a module that's MLS based. Even though you might not be using MLS, it is better to create a module that's MLS aware if you need to extend it afterwards. Um, <coughs> then the output is a special module file. Um, after that you're going to package it, so that means that you create a binary form and then from the binary form you can install it from there. Um, normally the first commands don't take that long. 
as a module minus I can take long depending on how big your policy is. Um, what needs to be done is you it reads the the, uh, the base policy, it reads the one that you're going to extend, it compiles a new one and then puts it back into the kernel. Um, again, before that used to take a long time, today I'm doing it on machines and it's taking a few seconds. Any questions? Normally the idea was to go over a policy. Um, actually, I don't know if I have a file here. So for Zarafa, for instance, you see here you have to define the types. So it's like variable definitions in the beginning you need to do. Um, then you um, tell it what it can do. So Apache needs to be able to connect to a specific socket. Um, it needs to be able to you, uh, read the, the home directory. Um, it needs to be able to write and create directories in Vadlib. Um, it needs to be able to create a socket file and write to that. Um, proc mail needed to do something um, and then here it's spam assassin it needed to be able to create um, directories and search in those directories for spam uh, uh, detection so once you have so this is what is basically an output from audit to allow it comes predefined already let's say you don't agree with this proc mail one then you just delete these ones and generate from there but this gives you a fair idea. So what audit to allow does is it goes through all the denial logs basically, and from there it will see what was the subject, what was the object, and it will create a policy that will allow that particular thing. So when you're grapping on it, or when you um, are creating that policy, only take those denial logs that you need, of course. There might be sometimes things in between which are things that you really want to deny. Yeah, so um, as a Linux project is the main uh, page. Um, I think Fabian mentioned already, Daniel Walsh is the biggest authority on this level. Um, so he normally is the, the, the permanent maintainer of Azure Linux on the open source side at least. Um, and he writes quite frequently about it. So it's interesting to look at it. Uh, and then, of course, CentOS project has there. As a Linux page, the Fedora project has theirs. Uh, Gentoo has an old explanation about that. Um, I saw recently that the Gentoo explanations actually got quite elaborate, um, sometimes a little bit more elaborate than the Fedora ones. So it might be relevant to look at there for some help also. Um, the one of Debian is not that extensive. So. Uh, Any questions? Yes? If the default policy allows something and you want to disable that, how can you do it with a custom policy? You override the default policy with a custom policy. The only problem with that is once the, the, the RPM package of as a Linux policy will get loaded, the default will get privileged normally always. Yeah, but in your example you have some alarm lines. <coughs> So if, if the default is to allow unconfined uh, to relabel something and you want to deny that explicitly, that how would I do that? Because I, if I leave out this line, it will still be in the default document yeah. policy as well. Um, is there like an explicit deny unconfined document or anything, or is there any allow? Um, the, the way to read the policy is, um, as Notion said, you just first declare some variables because those are the parts you want to include in your policy. Yeah. But then you still have to, that's just the policy. But the policy just verifies that a specific context, a specific demon in a specific context, is allowed to reach that specific file context. So, of course, you just to be, you, you, 
can you still deny something if the file context is wrong or the file system itself, right? Yeah. Well, so what, you, what, what would be most probably easier and quicker to do is create a separate file um, type for that particular ca use case, create your own policy for that, and uh, keep f from the base. Because the problem is, and this is what happened to me also a few times, is when you try to change base policies, and the new RPM comes in, it overrides that. And whatever you denied will get overwritten with the default. So the only way is create a new file type, create your own policy, and the base will stay off that. I know it's not the, the preferred solution, but at the moment I've not found any other way to do it. Um, what? Well, I don't know. That, I, I don't say that it's the way to go. That when we do a recent task, because we have SMB in our own on machine, right? We had to write some custom policy module that we had to do with Puppet, and we decided to to stick with something like CentOS underscore and the name of the module to be sure that we never conflict with the the the, 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 the modules coming from the base package from your SMB policy target RPM. Yeah. So we should have, we never conflict with those. But something you want to test is that, for example, when you want to do some upgrade from, let's say, 6.4 to 6.5, you just want to verify that your policy is still compilable. Because what it does with the type of enforcement when you compile it, uh, you still need to be sure that it's still valid with a new uh, package coming from uh, the new policy, from the SMDX policy target earlier. So this is basically being checked against the base policy. Yeah. yeah. So, so at that point, you need to recompile it for the right one. <coughs> Say you have a dovecot policy that comes with RHEL, and then you have an SC Linux dovecot policy. Both modules get loaded. No, no, no. no. The, the so MLC? modules with the same name cannot be loaded twice. So if, let's say, Red Hat pushes a dovecot uh, module, then if you push yours, it will overwrite the default. But the next time Red Hat pushes an RPM with the base policy, where, where this dovecot is in, it gets over it, it overwrites yours. And as long as the version is different. That's why you see if you can still provide, provide a version number. Yeah, so you provide a version number. So unless you put these version numbers so high, let's say 1,000, 2,000, 10,000, yeah. I presume Red Hat is not going to go that far. Yeah. What would happen then? When, when, actually, it's given the fact that uh, I have a software product running that currently there is no default policy for. So I write a new policy and give it a name that probably won't get overwritten by making it unique, by attaching yeah. the company name to it or whatever. Yeah. And then, in the next release, the base policy contains a policy for the same product. So we have the same objects and two policies trying to define restrictions the on the high, objects. The higher version number will win. The higher version number will be independent of the name of the product. Yes. Okay. Um, That's what happened with the Zarafa. So I told you, yes. with Zarafa I had a module which was named the same. Yeah. So when I did the first update and they added Zarafa, I think in 6.1 or 6.2, I don't remember which version, um, mine got overwritten. So for 6.3, I changed the name. But I chose a number, I think it was 10,000 and something, whatever. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Obviously, you know that that won't be overwritten. Um, but what it will do is it will load at that point. Um, yours might have to be recompiled again. <laughs> I've had few corner cases where you have to recompile. Um, when I asked on the IRC, I didn't get a definite answer why that was necessary. So I don't know exactly. But the interesting question is how, how will it do that? Because it's, it's only the objects that are... That are the subject and object same. is being yeah. checked. Huh? So a subject, let's say a Zarafa daemon, yeah. is being checked against a, a Zarafa configuration file or a Zarafa uh, mail that is coming the number being the tiebreaker. Yeah, with the version number being time here. That's why here, um, yeah, so you see in these ones I was still using 1.4. Mm -hmm. Now I, I put actually 1000.4 and 10.000.4. And okay. So I know that it's my fourth edition and I know that I'm using the 1000 to avoid getting into trouble with the upstream vendors. Does that make sense? <laughs> Any other questions? Thank you.